All right. Thanks for coming, everyone. Hopefully this sermon is a blessing to you, but I want to preach today on the topic of the secret to serving Jesus. The secret to serving Jesus. Now, obviously, it's not so much of a secret because if you wanted to find out, you can just look in the Bible. But when I talk about the secret to serving Jesus, what is like the secret ingredient? What's going to make somebody push through it, through thick and thin, through trials and tribulation, through different things? What's going to make somebody keep serving Jesus even when the times are tough, even when it's no longer exciting, even when it's hard to do? The secret to serving Jesus. So what I want to do in this sermon today is I want to look at the life of Peter and get some applications from the life of Peter the Apostle in the Gospels and look at different things, different factors on why some people serve Jesus and why those things won't always last. The secret to serving Jesus. Um, Let's look first of all at knowledge. So we started at Matthew 16. And some people think the secret to serving Jesus is just that they learn more and more and more and more. So we started in Matthew 16 where Peter actually got some revelation from God about Jesus Christ. It says when Jesus came into the coast of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples saying, Whom do men say that I the Son of Man am? And they said, Some say that thou art John the Baptist, some say Elias, So what's Elias? That's Elijah. And others, Jeremiah, Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He saith unto them, But whom say ye that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. So Peter answered right. Peter said that Jesus was the Son of God, the Christ, the Messiah, the one that was to come and die for our sins. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona. And this is what I want to focus on here in Matthew 16. For flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. See, as we learn truth about God, as we learn truth from God's word, God is revealing truths to us, speaking to us through his word, through the Holy Spirit. And some people think that, hey, if I just keep learning more and more and more, don't get me wrong, that's not a, it's not a bad thing to learn more and more. But is that what's going to get people sticking it out, thick and thin, serving Jesus, if they just learn more and more? Well, no, because how many people do you know that have been in church for years and years and decades and decades and decades, learning and learning and learning, reading and reading, but that doesn't get them out in the highways and hedges? to do actual work for Jesus, working in the ministry, working to win souls. See, people know, have a lot of knowledge. And it's like that in our churches as well, churches like ours, where you're getting a lot of Bible doctrine preached, you're learning a lot of Bible, and a lot of babes in Christ know a lot of Bible. How many people do you know like that, where they just listen to sermon after sermon after sermon, and they love listening to sermons? Well, what's going to get them out and actually serve Jesus? actually get involved in the highways and hedges, out there preaching the gospel. What is it? Is it knowledge? Well, how did it do for Peter? If we read on in this passage, he says, I say unto thee that thou art Peter upon this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. So Jesus is not building his church on a man like the Catholic church believes. No, this rock that he's building the church on is him. The fact that He is the Christ, the Son of the living God. It's upon that rock. Jesus is the rock that we build our faith on. It's upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it, and I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. I believe that's a reference to us getting people saved. The keys to the kingdom, being able to get people into heaven by preaching them the gospel. Then charged he his disciples that they should tell no man that he was Jesus the Christ. So Peter got this extra revelation from God, from God the Father, telling him that that Jesus was the Christ, the Son of God. But look, what's happening, it's funny in this passage. 
is that Catholics will say, hey, Jesus built the church on the Apostle Peter. But when you just keep reading down a couple of verses into verse 21, it says, from that time forth began Jesus to show unto his disciples how that he must go unto Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised again the third day. So what is Jesus now saying to Peter? So Peter has had this great truth revealed to him from Jesus. And then Jesus goes on to say, you know what I have to do as the Christ, as the Son of God? I've got to go to Jerusalem and I've got to suffer many things of the elders and chiefs and priests and scribes and be killed and raised again the third day. I've got to go and fulfill the gospel. I've got to go and do the will of the Father, which God gave his Son to be a sacrifice for us. Now, Peter, Peter has a lot of knowledge, right? Verse 22, then Peter took him. Look at what he does. And began to rebuke him. Can you believe that? Can you believe that a follower of Jesus Christ would correct Jesus? You know, I've heard it said before that if Jesus, if Jesus came up to a whiteboard and drew a straight line, you better believe that's a perfect straight line. You don't go up to Jesus and try and correct that line. You don't correct Jesus' word, but this is what a little knowledge can do. So knowledge is not a bad thing, but when you have a little knowledge and you don't have the right perspective on things, sometimes you can get a little bit puffed up. You can get a little proud. And Jesus here is not just rebuking somebody that has authority over him. He's rebuking the Lord Jesus Christ himself. Then Peter took him and began to rebuke him, saying, Be it far from thee, Lord, this shall not be unto thee. So he's saying, No, no, you're not going to die. Going against what Jesus came here to do. But he turned and said unto Peter, Get thee behind me, Satan. Thou art an offence unto me, for thou savourest not the things that be of God, but those that be of men. So would Jesus have built the church on somebody who can have a satanic influence where he's saying, get thee behind me, Satan. Thou art an offense unto me, for thou savorest not the things that be of God, but those that be of men. So the secret to serving Jesus is not just knowledge. Knowledge is a good thing. You have to increase in knowledge. But is that the secret to serving Jesus? Well, you know, when we look at one of the examples of Peter in the Gospels, It didn't work out so well for him in the sense that he learned things of God directly. But, you know, he also got a bit puffed up here when he corrected Jesus. Let's go on to the second factor. What's another thing that gets people to serve Jesus? But is this a secret to serve Jesus? Is this this one to get you to serve Jesus long term? Is it excitement? Well, let's look at, again, the life of Peter, where the disciples got excited about things. And they had a lot of zeal. They had a lot of passion. But how did it pan out for them? Matthew 26, here. We'll read, Then saith Jesus unto them, All ye shall be offended because of me this night. For it is written, I will smite the shepherd, and the sheep of the flock shall be scattered abroad. I think it's good for us as believers to always read through the Gospels and to read through these passages and remember, uh, you know, what Jesus has done for us. But here we are reading just after the Last Supper. The disciples have eaten together. Jesus now says to them, hey, tonight he's going to die for them. He's going to go to the cross. But after I am risen again, I will go before you into Galilee. Peter answered and said unto him, Though all men shall be offended because of thee, yet will I never be offended. You see how he has zeal, he has passion, he has big ideas for Jesus on what he's going to accomplish. That's a big word, never. Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, that this night before the cock crow thou shalt deny me thrice. Peter said unto him, Though I should die with thee, yet will I not deny thee. Now, I don't know if you notice this, but at the end here of verse 35, it says, Likewise also said all the disciples. So it wasn't just Peter that said, Hey, I'm going to die with you. I will not deny you. 
all the disciples that were there at the Last Supper said the same thing, that we will be with you, Jesus, through thick and thin, you know, till death. But how did it go? Let's read on in Matthew 26. Then cometh Jesus with them unto a place called Gethsemane, and saith unto his disciples, Sit ye here while I pray, while I go and pray yonder. So they're talking about dying with Jesus. They're talking about, hey, we will never deny thee. And as they leave the Last Supper and they go out into the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus asks them something a lot easier than dying with him. He says, hey, sit ye here while I go and pray yonder. And he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, so that's James and John, and began to be sorrowful and very heavy. Then saith he unto them, My soul is exceeding sorrowful, even unto death. Tarry ye here, and watch with me. As we read this passage, guys, I want you to think about what the Lord Jesus Christ is thinking and what he went through. And he went a little further and fell on his face and prayed, saying, Oh, my Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt. So you see the humanity of Jesus Christ here as he's struggling in the garden. He's sorrowful even unto death. He's not looking forward to going through what he needs to, but he wants to fulfill the will of his Father because of love he goes to the cross. Oh, my Father, if it be possible, he's pleading with God and saying, hey, is there any other way that people can be saved? No, because the only way we can be saved is through the Lord Jesus Christ. If it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt. And he cometh unto his disciples and findeth them asleep. And look, he says this to Peter, the one that led the charge, saying, Though all deny thee, yet will I not deny thee. Saith unto Peter, What? Could ye not watch with me one hour? So I don't know if the disciples started to understand here as he's revealing to them gently hey you're saying you're willing to die with me but you couldn't even watch and pray with me for one hour one hour is not a long not a lot of time if you've ever been in a prayer meeting you go around a circle and you pray maybe three people can pray in an hour quite easily watch and pray that you enter not into temptation the spirit indeed is willing but the flesh is weak he went away again the second time and prayed, saying, Oh, my Father, if this cup may not pass away from me except I drink it, thy will be done. And he came and found them asleep again, for their eyes were heavy. And he left them and went away again and prayed the third time, saying the same words. Then cometh he to his disciples and saith unto them, Sleep on now and take your rest. Behold, the hour is at hand, and the Son of Man is betrayed into the hand of sinners. Rise, let us be going. Behold, he is at hand that doth betray me. And while he yet spake, lo, Judas, one of the twelve, came, and with him a great multitude with swords and staves from the chief priests and elders of the people. We won't read the rest of that passage, but you know that in the Garden of Gethsemane, Judas comes. Um, and we learn in the other Gospels that actually Peter drew a sword and cut off one of the servant's ears. And if you didn't know this, Jesus actually went and healed that servant's ear. Right? And that servant's name was Malchus, we learn in the Gospel of John. So Peter had excitement. Peter had zeal. But let's see how that worked out for him. And if you know this story, it's very familiar. This is the three denials of Peter. We read further on in Matthew 26, in that same hour, said Jesus to the multitudes. I just wanted to read a bit further down in this passage in Matthew 26, because I wanted to show you something that the disciples did as well before we get to Peter's denials. In that same hour, said Jesus to the multitudes, are you come out as against a thief with swords and stays for to take me? So what is he saying here? You're coming here as though I'm a criminal, as though I've done something dangerous, but I taught daily, I sat daily with you, 
teaching in the temple and you laid no hold on me? But all this was done that the scriptures of the prophets might be fulfilled. Look at this. Then all the disciples forsook him and fled. All the disciples left Jesus alone as Jesus left to be taken away, to be trialed unjustly and to be crucified. So I think it's interesting here in Matthew that it mentions that all the disciples said that they would go with Jesus through death. And yet when times got hard, you know, they were excited. You know, Peter led the charge. Hey, yet they'll all deny thee, yet will I not deny thee. All the disciples said likewise. They had the zeal, they had the passion, they had that excitement. And then when times got hard, what happened? All the disciples forsook him and fled. And here we get on, I'm, I'm jumping over to the Gospel of Luke now. Luke 22, as we see the denials of Peter. Then took they him and led him and brought him into the high priest's house. And Peter followed afar off. So you see here, Peter is following Jesus as Jesus is getting taken away by the guards to be trialed unjustly. And he doesn't think that Jesus knows that he's there, right? He's trailing behind, far behind following Jesus. And when they had kindled a fire in the midst of the hall and were set down together, Peter sat down among them. But a certain maid beheld him as he sat by the fire and earnestly looked upon him and said, This man was also with him. So here's a chance for Peter to stand up, to take a stand for Jesus Christ and say, Yes, I was with Jesus Christ and I am not going to deny him. But is that what he did? Verse 57. And he denied him, saying, Woman, I know him not. And after a little while, another saw him and said, Thou art also of them. And Peter said, Man, I am not. And about the space of one hour, after another confidently affirmed, saying, Of a truth, this fellow also was with him, for he is a Galilean. And we know in other Gospels, they say, Hey, your speech, we know by the way you're talking that you're a Galilean. And we saw you with Jesus Christ. And Peter said, Man, I know not what thou sayest. And immediately, while he yet spake, the cock crew. This is what's interesting about the Gospel of Luke when it accounts, recounts the denials of Peter. It said, And the Lord turned and looked upon Peter. Can you imagine what Peter was thinking in that moment? Just earlier on that day, he was saying, hey, I'm going to go to death with you. He led the charge to say, hey, all the disciples said the same thing. And as he's following secretly, he thinks he's far enough away from Jesus that Jesus doesn't know he's there. And the moment the cock crows after Peter denies him, the Lord Jesus looks straight at Peter in the eyes. He knew it was there. He knew it was going to happen. Can you imagine what Peter was feeling? Man, when I read this verse, it's just like, in my heart, it's just like, oh. It just must have felt so bad for Peter to be so zealous about serving God. And yet when the times got rough, he denied him three times. Oh. And Peter remembered the word of the Lord, how he had said unto him, Before the cock crow, thou shalt deny me thrice. And Peter went out and wept bitterly. <sighs> Sometimes when I read that passage, it just makes me feel for Peter, you know? Because Peter was right there. He wanted to serve Jesus with his life. And then when the times got tough, man, he turned on him. And he thought he could get away with it. But no. The Lord looked on him. And you get a feel for how Peter felt in this passage. When he thought he was doing things that the Lord didn't know, the Lord looked on him, looked straight at him in the face, and Peter remembered the word of the Lord, how he had said unto him, Before the cock crow, thou shalt deny me thrice. Peter went out and wept bitterly. So is it excitement that's going to make you serve the Lord Jesus? No, excitement doesn't make you serve the Lord Jesus because excitement can wane. 
You know, people get excited all the time. Man, when you're a new believer, you get excited, don't you? You're learning new things. You're learning new knowledge. Man, everything's new. Everything's ex exciting. Maybe things are emotional for you. But man, when the times get tough, when you start seeing the ridicule, when you start going through hard times, is that the secret to serving Jesus? Is that what's going to keep you going when the times get tough? That's not what got, kept Peter going. Man, it was tough when he realized he didn't hold up his end of the bargain when he said he would stand for Jesus. What about a spiritual encounter? This is the last one I want to talk about. What about a spiritual encounter? And the Pentecostals, they love their spiritual encounters. Right? The Mormons get the burning in the bosom. But you know, Bible-believing Christians, they get spiritual encounters too, where they believe, hey, the Spirit of God moved. Maybe in a church meeting where they felt like, hey, the Spirit of God was moving. I was touched by God. Hey, God spoke to me when I came to church this morning and I heard from His Word. I had this spiritual encounter. Or maybe they go on a family camp. They go on a youth camp. How many youth go to a youth camp and they, and they meet Jesus? Right? The preaching is powerful. The Spirit moves. Man, there's an altar call at those Bible camps and they go down. You know, they're not even married yet. They don't even know what it's like to raise children. But they're going to give their life to serve the Lord Jesus. They want to be a preacher one day. They don't even know what it's like to be married, to lead a family, to lead children. And yet they're going to give their life. They had that spiritual encounter to serve the Lord Jesus Christ. Is that what it's going to take? Is that the secret to serving Jesus, this spiritual encounter? Guess who else had a supernatural encounter? Hey, the Apostle Peter had many supernatural encounters. But here, even after Jesus died, he rose again. The Apostles had a spiritual encounter, a supernatural encounter with the Lord Jesus Christ. Then the same day at evening, this is after Jesus rose again from the dead, being the first day of the week when the doors were shut, where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, came Jesus and stood in the midst and saith unto them, Peace be unto you. And when he had so said, he showed unto them his hands and his side. Then were the disciples glad when they saw the Lord. See, when you have a spiritual encounter, it's a great thing, isn't it? People are joyful. People are happy. People are excited that they have this spiritual encounter. Then said Jesus to them again, Peace be unto you. As my Father has sent me, even so send I you. So you see how when you, have, when you come to church, when you hear preaching, when you have this spiritual encounter, the call is to serve Jesus. And the same when Jesus appears to his disciples, what does he say to them? He says, as my Father has sent me, even so send I you. You see how it's a call to go into all the world and preach the gospel when he appears back to them? Hey, it's not just to give you a pick-me-up. It's, it's not just to make you feel good about yourself. It's a, it's a charge and a call. It's a reminder to serve the Lord Jesus. And here's what he says to his disciples. Hey, as my Father had sent me, even so send I you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and saith unto them, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. Whosoever sins ye remit, they are remitted unto them. And whosoever sins ye retain, they are retained. So that's John chapter 20. Now after Jesus rose again, he came to them supernaturally. He showed them the hands, the print in his hands and his side and said, hey, go and I'm going to send you just as I was sent. You only have to read to chapter 21 where we read about Peter again. In verse 21, After these things Jesus showed himself again to the disciples at the Sea of Tiberias, and on this wise showed he himself. There were together Simon Peter and Thomas called Didymus and Nathanael of Cana in Galilee and the sons of Zebedee and two other of his disciples. Simon Peter saith unto him, I go a fishing. So you see how Jesus had just risen to them, risen again. He appeared to them. He gave them a charge to go and preach the gospel. And in the very next chapter, what is Peter doing? He's going back to his old ways. He's going back fishing. They say unto him, we also go with thee. 
I think it's important to note that see, when Peter was backslidden and went back to his old ways, it affected his friends as well. So you see, when we get backslidden, when we stop serving the Lord Jesus Christ, that's going to affect not only our family, our spouse, it's going to affect the people that we influence as well, our friends. You know, sometimes you have friends that you have influence over, that you can influence. They look to you as a leader, just subconsciously. And if you are not serving the Lord Jesus, they will not serve the Lord Jesus either. We see that even in our church. Right? When people come, their friends come too. Their family comes too. They don't come, their friends don't come. They went forth and entered into a ship immediately. And that night, they caught nothing. But then when the morning was now come, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples knew not that it was Jesus. Then Jesus saith unto them, Children, have ye any meat? I think it's interesting that Jesus uses the word meat here, because it reminds me of John 6, where he says, Labor not for the meat which perisheth. They answered him, No. And he said unto them, Cast the net on the right side of the ship, and ye shall find. They cast therefore, and now they were not able to draw it for the multitude of fishes. Therefore that disciple whom Jesus loved, who's that? That's John. We learn about that later on in the chapter. Whom Jesus loved, saith unto Peter, It is the Lord. Now how did they know that it was the Lord Jesus Christ? Well, it's because they're reminded of when Jesus originally called them. In Luke 5, we see here, And it came to pass that as the people pressed upon him to hear the word of God, he stood by the lake of Gennesaret. So this is where Jesus first met Simon Peter, on by the lake of Gennesaret, and saw two ships standing by the lake, but the fishermen were gone out of them and were washing their nets. And he entered into one of the ships, which was Simon's. So you see how this is where Jesus first met Simon Peter. He was preaching by the lake of Gennesaret. And then he asked Peter, hey, can I go in your boat? You push it out a bit so I can preach to the people. Because a lot of people believe that the waves would carry the sound to more people. More people could hear it. And prayed him that he would thrust out a little from the land. And he sat down and taught the people out of the ship. Now when he had left speaking, he said unto Simon, launch out into the deep and let down your nets for a draught. And Simon answering and said unto him, Master, you see how it's reminding them of Jesus' initial call to them? We have toiled all the night and have taken nothing. Nevertheless, at thy word. You see, it's not wrong to work. See, we've talked about this before. It's not wrong to work and make a living as long as the reason why you're doing it is for Jesus. So you see, when Peter went fishing again, he wasn't doing that for Jesus anymore. He was backslidden. He was getting away from Jesus. And it wasn't until Jesus said, hey, cast the net on the right side that they caught something. Because Jesus is blessing their work because they're doing it for the right reasons. Nevertheless, at thy word, I will let down the net. And when they had done this, they enclosed a great multitude of fishes and their net break. And they beckoned unto their partners, which were in the other ship, that they should come and help them. And they came and filled both the ships, so that they began to sink. So you see, there were so many fish that they caught, that the ships began to sink. When Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. For he was astonished, and all that were with him at the draught of the fishes which had been taken. And so was also James and John, the son of Zebedee, which were partners with Simon. And Jesus said unto Simon, Fear not, from henceforth, from henceforth thou shalt catch men. So the reason why it's significant in John 21, when Jesus goes back fishing and he tells them to cast the net on the other side and they catch fish, is that it's reminding them subtly of this moment in time when Jesus called them and said, hey, you're no longer be, going to be fishers, you're going to be fishers of men. And in John 20, they went back to their old ways. They went back to something they weren't meant to do because Jesus had called them to be fishers of men. And when they had brought their ships to land, they forsook all and followed him. Let's read on. In John chapter 21. And let's look at the secret to serving Jesus. 
So what have we talked about so far? Is it knowledge? It's just learning more and more. Is that going to get you to serve Jesus? No, because how many people sit in church week after week after week, learning Bible sermon after Bible sermon after Bible sermon for years and years and years. They listen to sermon after, man, they love that preacher. Listen to all this and they go back and listen to all the sermons. I want to learn as much as they can. Does that get them serving the Lord? Is that the secret? What about excitement? A new believer gets in church, man, things are new. Things are exciting. Things are happening. But then when things get rough, where are they? When things aren't exciting anymore. What, what's, what happens when they realize it actually takes hard work? Man, it actually takes some perseverance to serve Jesus. It actually takes some hard toil and some organization and some labor and some diligence. That's not always fun. So what's the secret? What's going to make you do that? Is it going to be an encounter, a spiritual encounter, where you have a one-off emotional high? Maybe you go to a camp, maybe you hear one sermon that gets you all excited. Is that going to make the difference? No. Did that make the difference for the disciples? No. So what does Jesus say here in John 21? Let's continue to read the story. Jesus saith unto them, Bring of the fish which ye have now caught. Simon Peter went up and drew the net to land full of great fishes, and hundred and fifty and three. And for all there were so many, yet was not the net broken. Jesus saith unto them, Come and dine. And none of the disciples durst ask him. What does durst mean? Durst is the past tense of, of dare. And none of the disciples dared ask him, durst ask him, Who art thou? Knowing that it was the Lord. Jesus then cometh and taketh bread and giveth them, and fish likewise. So this is very significant as we read into the next passages, that Jesus, he's called them back to land. He's reminded them that I have called you to be fishers of men. And he comes and he feeds them. When they come to shore, he's got some coals going. And he puts bread and fish onto the coals. This is now the third time that Jesus showed himself to his disciples after that he was risen from the dead. So when they had dined, Jesus saith to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me more than these? Lovest thou these? Lovest thou me more than these? That, my friend, is the secret to serving Jesus. And Peter's, you know, Jesus is not just saying here to Peter, do you love to eat more than you love me? Because what was the significance of fish to Peter? That was his career. That was his livelihood. That's what he did before. And Jesus is asking him, hey, do you love your own life more than you love me? That's the secret, my friend. That's the secret to what's going to make you serve Jesus, what's going to make you go through thick and thin. You've got to ask yourself that question. Do I love Jesus more than what I'm doing instead of serving Jesus? Do I love Jesus more than my job? Do I love Jesus more than sleeping in? Do I love Jesus more than being ridiculed, more than my family? Do I love Jesus more than making money? This is the secret to serving Jesus, is do you love Jesus more than whatever reason it is that you're thinking of right now to not serve Jesus? And this is what he's reminding the disciples of. As he says to Peter, as he's eating with him, they look down at the fish and he says, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me more than these? He saith unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He saith unto him, Feed my lambs, serve me. He saith to him again the second time, Simon, son of Jonas, Lovest thou me? You'll notice here this time he doesn't make the comparison. He just asks him, hey, do you love me? 
Because he already asked him the first time, do you love me more than fish? He says, yes. So he asks him again, do you really mean it? Do you really love me? He saith unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He saith unto him, Feed my sheep. He saith unto him the third time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? Peter was grieved because he said unto him the third time, Lovest thou me? Thou me. And he said unto him, Lord, thou knowest all things. Thou knowest that I love thee. Jesus saith unto him, Feed my sheep. Now, what is the significance of Jesus asking Peter three times whether he loves him? Because Peter denied the Lord three times. That's why it's significant. So you see how Jesus is reminding Peter. Hey, you know what? You need to love me more than you love these. Do you really love me? That's the secret to serving Jesus. But the thing is, what's going to make you love Jesus so much that you will serve him more than whatever you're thinking of right now that will make you not serve him? It's to be reminded of what Jesus did for you. So do you see here that Jesus is reminding Peter of the three denials. Why? Because while Peter was at the fire saying, I know not the man, what was Jesus doing? Jesus was going to the cross. He was standing up for us. He was standing for our sins and dying for us. See, when you're reminded of that, when you think of what Jesus has done for you, that's what's going to make you go, thick and thin, go through thick and thin. It's not going to matter how much knowledge you know because you love the Lord Jesus Christ. You're going to want to serve him. See, when times get rough, you're going to think about how what Jesus went through. That Jesus went to the cross for our sins. He died on the cross. He was buried. He went to hell for three days and three nights for you. And when you think about that, what Jesus did for us, how he loves us, how we fail him, how we fail him all the time, just like Peter. This is what makes me think about Peter's story. Because as a believer, you think even as a bishop, can you imagine what Peter was thinking? I'm sure he's thinking the same thing you think when you try and take a stand for Jesus, but you fail. And even though you fail, Jesus knew you were going to fail. And he went to the cross for you anyway. What an amazing thing. What amazing love. And as you learn about your sin more and more, as you grow in your faith and you learn how sinful you are, gosh, it just makes you realize how much God loves you. And you know it's being reminded of that. That's what's going to make you serve the Lord Jesus. What makes you get up early in the morning? What makes you stay up late at night? What makes you, on a hot day, go out and preach the gospel? You know, what makes you, on a cold day, when it's raining, say, you know what, I'm just going to grab an umbrella, go soul winning anyway? It's not because you're great. It's not because you're something special. It's because you remember what Jesus Christ did for you. And you remember that you're not worthy. And this is the least I can do. The least I can do, which is my reasonable service. And I'm glad I brought one of these to church today. This was actually for the Bible club, but it came in handy. Ugh. That's what's going to make you serve Jesus. That's the secret, my friend. And Jesus showed us no greater love. This is what Jesus said in John 15. Greater love hath no man than this, than a man lay down his life for his friends. 
Do you see how what Jesus did for us was the greatest love that somebody could do for another person? And he did that for you. Do you realize that? That's why it's so important when we take of the Lord's Supper, we think about it. We remember. That's why he gave it to us, to be reminded, because it's so easy to forget what Jesus did. For you go about your daily business, you go about your day, you don't think about what Jesus did for you. But when you come to church, you're reminded. When you eat of that bread and you drink of that cup, you're reminded that the Lord Jesus Christ, he went to hell for me and rose again from the dead so that I could be saved. And it's that love that's going to drive you to serve the Lord Jesus. John 14, if you love me, keep my commandments. So that's the secret to serving Jesus. It's not just how much you learn. It's not just how excited you get. It's not just a spiritual encounter, because these, these things fade. But you know what's going to make you continue to serve Jesus when there's ridicule, when times get tough, when it's hot outside, when you don't feel like it anymore? It's love, my friend. Love is what is going to make you serve the Lord Jesus. And if you're reminded of what Jesus did for you, hopefully you will love him as we ought. All right, let's pray. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for dying for us. Lord, we are a sinful people. I really feel for the Apostle Peter. You know, when you called him, he said, Lord, depart from me, I'm a sinful man. And even when he tried to take a stand, Lord, he, he failed miserably. He denied you three times. He thought he got away with it, but he didn't. Even after he rose again, he rose again from the dead, he went back fishing. Help us, Lord, to love you more than we love our job, our career, money, fame, and even family and friends. And I pray, Lord, that we will be reminded of the love you showed us, so that through this love that we experience, Lord, we will in turn love you and keep your commandments. We thank you, we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, let's stand and sing one last song. Let's stand and sing, I love to tell the story. I love to tell the story. And this is going to prepare our hearts. Stay afterwards. Hopefully you stay for lunch, stay for something to eat. And then after lunch, we're going to go out, we're going to preach the gospel because we're going to love Jesus and keep his commandments. Here we go.